Palace on current form are heading for relegation if it continues at this rate. I still feel like City and Liverpool are a cut above in this title race. I don't know whether a club has, I'd be interested to hear people's thoughts, ever had a more successful summer window or any window than Leverkusen. Hello and welcome back to Monday Vibes, everybody, where we talk about the biggest results and talking points from across the football weekend. Lots to discuss today. I'm joined by Mikey McCubbs. How are you? Yeah, good thanks, Diggs. Yeah. Good thanks. I was actually at the Brentford game on Saturday. Yes. Uh, which was good filming fun. Filming some fun content. Yeah, filming some fun content. Uh, we'll be yeah, on your screens probably this week on Sky Sports Premier League. Um, and yeah, Brentford fans obviously very, very happy. Uh, it was my first time at the Brentford Community Stadium, or the G-Tech as it's known. Um, yeah, it was cool. It was cool. Good yeah, atmosphere. nice stadium, good atmosphere. I think everyone was just really happy to see Tony back, despite his comments last week um, about yes. you know Angling basically move. wanting to leave. Um, but uh, but yeah, like you know, fun fun goal from him to to equalise in the first half as well. Um, so yeah, all, all yeah, good good all round. It's it's funny because it's a small stadium, but it's you know it's like it's designed not too dissimilarly from say like the Spurs stadium in terms of like the actual fan experience mm. and they have you know a very like american light show you know before the game and everything like that so it is very you know it is very modern in that sense mm -hmm. uh, how about yourself Diggs? You it was muscle? good thank you good lots of wedding planning it's under a month to go now Ooh. and uh yeah last night was but yeah probably a highlight of the weekend going to the football writers association mm. tribute dinner for emma hayes what an impressive person she is she did like a sort of 10 15 minute monologue about her journey and I didn't realise that she just actually lost her dad in December as well, so it was, really? quite, it was quite emotive. Um, lots of her family were there. Uh, Frank Kirby did a great tribute to her as well, and Carly Telford. So it was a, it was a special evening. Uh, but let's get into today's video, really. Let's get into the hot topic, really, which is Newcastle's transfers, McCubbs, because yes. it has been a quiet transfer window. I think there's been two moves for over £20 million so far. There was 13 in the entirety of the window last year, and that's probably quite unsurprising given the Premier League is really sort of hardening its stance on FFP breaches. Mm. But Newcastle, again, another club that are trying to stay within the confines of FFP, are supposedly facing interest from really top European clubs in a number of their players, most notably Kieran Trippier. Yes, Kieran Trippier. I mean, on that, by the way, Diggs, thought it was a quiet window, but then... Ben, ben Brereton Diaz pops up and scores for Sheffield United Huge. on the weekend. I did not know that that move had happened. Yeah. Uh, that, is the, loan there. that is the that is the move of January so <laughs> far. I think Ben Brereton Diaz on loan from Villarreal. Whether it'll be enough to keep uh, Sheffield United up is, a, is another matter. Probably not, but we'll see. But yes, this Trippier story does feel like it's come out of the blue a little bit. Um, Barn, of course, have already secured the services of Eric Dyer, who was an unused substitute this weekend in their loss to Werder Bremen. Um, uh, but yeah, Tuchel seems to be just still keen on, on getting Premier English, players. you know, Premier League British players in. Wanted, well, supposedly wanted McTominay in the summer, didn't he? Um, not sure how much uh, you know how much power there was behind that, really. But Sky Germany now coming out and, and reporting over the weekend that Newcastle demanding around 11 or 12 million pounds to sell Kieran Trippier to Bayern Munich. My gut feeling is that they'd want more than that in reality. Um, that seems like a lot of money, uh, a, a, a very small amount of money to sell one of your key leadership figures, maybe your key leadership figure, and probably over the last 18 months, your most consistent performer, someone who has really embodied Newcastle's rise under Eddie Howe, um, even if he has had a bit of a dodgy couple of months. Mm. Um, Florian Plettenberg, of course, the kind of chief kind of transfer guru at Sky Germany, is reporting that while Nudi Mokieli um, Mukieli, sorry, was their first choice. Uh, talks have reached a bit of an impasse. Uh, PSG are insisting on an obligation to sign him permanently following an initial loan. Um, and I guess Trippier, in terms of, uh, you know, what, what they'd be getting is a bit of a more known entity, has played a lot more football over the last two years, even if Mukieli has great Bundesliga experience, of course, from his time with RB Leipzig. Um, and Sky Sports News are reporting that Trippier is apparently open to a move uh, to Germany. Again, not overly... I mean, I kind of thought he would maybe be a bit more loyal to Newcastle, maybe given... Just kind of given what, what they've achieved, especially what they achieved last mm. year and how central he was to it. But at the same time, a move to Bayern Munich where you would be a starter straight away 
in that Bayern Munich back line. Um, I, I, can, I can see why he would want it, um, for sure. Um, but Dukes, I mean, it does seem a little bit mad, given that Newcastle will be wanting to go for at least a Europa spot again this season. I think Champions League is out of the question probably at this point. Um, I mean, and also Trippi is not the only one who, who could be leaving, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's interest in a number of players, which I'll touch on in due course. But it does feel like Bayern and Tuchel are really, or Tuchel in particular is really, as you say, really rating English players. I, f- I forget they tried to get Carl Walker in I the summer as well. I was just about to say, yeah, really tried really hard to get Carl Walker in the early part of the summer. Obviously for Newcastle, this is pretty unthinkable to sell mm. probably your best player in January, or at least your, as you say, most consistent player, um, especially just in the midst of this really terrible run. They've lost six of their last seven games. They've slipped to 10th, but now 14 points off the Champions League spots. And whilst it felt like it was going to be difficult for Newcastle to finish fourth or above once again this year, uh, given the strength of, of other teams and the strengthening of the likes of Liverpool, etc., um, it it you know this season has been a huge disappointment really to be to be tenth at this stage is 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 not good well whatsoever uh trippy is 33 obviously so he's probably one of their higher earners as well they're, tr- they're trying to raise funds to strengthen the midfield because tonali's been banned joe linton needs surgery you know that is not an ideal situation whatsoever mm. they do also have livramento who they spent what 32 million pounds on in the summer but he's just such a different player to Trippier in many ways. Like he's obviously much more of a sort of end-to-end, box-to-box uh, running threat, whereas Trippier's got a lot more guile to his game, much better set pieces. And despite that dip in form, Trippier is still really crucial to Newcastle. I mean, this season, uh, he's got the most assists in their squad with seven, most passes, most passes into the final third, passes into the penalty area, crosses into the penalty area, and tackles and interceptions. So selling him in January feels a little bit unthinkable. But as you say, it's not the only player that is gaining or garnering interest from around Europe. I mean, Atletico Madrid were supposedly considering a move for Callum Wilson. Uh, Angel Carrera is in talks with Al Itahad over a move to Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's obviously been a bit part player at Atleti for a number of years now, but has been useful on occasion. Mm. But I think Callum Wilson doesn't feel like a move that Atleti are going to go for anymore. They're now looking at Moisa Ken uh, from Juventus on a loan deal, yeah. who has had just a bizarre career if he gets a move to Atleti yeah. as well. Like that amazing season at PSG, but Everton, Juve, then Atletico Madrid, you know, hasn't really kicked on as you'd expect for a 23 year old. And then just before we started shooting, Ben Jacobs is reporting that Al Shabab are looking at Miguel Almiron. So it feels like there's, you know, a sort of a lot of interest in Newcastle players all of a sudden. All these players who are getting towards the end of their career, let's say, to be polite. Uh, but I think Trippier of all of them feels like the biggest loss. Having said that, yeah. you know, they've had issues up front with Isak and Wilson when neither of them had been available. There's not that much depth in forward areas. I wouldn't want to sell Callum Wilson in January. Uh, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to sell Almer. I don't think I want to sell Almer. I mean, I mean, they've had upwards of 10 injuries at points this season. To be fair, I mean, they do have a number of players due back, none more so Harvey Barnes. Uh, but at the same time, Anthony Gordon has been that has been their most consistent attacker this season and so left wing is not necessarily their their biggest area of need um and i think generally their de- you know their depth at centre forward is you know having two players the caliber of Isaac and Callum Wilson is is great but obviously both have had their injury issues at points especially Callum Wilson um and Almiron yeah there just isn't really a top you know there isn't a top replacement for Almiron or top backup for for Almiron in that squad either um how has obviously had to you know rely on on you know players like Miley you know players from the academy um Livermento has had to fill in at left back mm. and right back at points um so yeah uh it, it's not the most you know it's, it's it's not the most deep squad and given that they've spent i think 400 million since how came in um you know there is there is work to do that they will have to be i think yeah cleverer in the in the transfer market even though so many of their signings have been hit um the tonali situation i think is has exacerbated things you know that was you know something that you know they could they couldn't have foreseen um in the summer um so so yeah it's an interesting one for newcastle i agree with you dukes i just don't see how they can afford to sell those top players at this point i kind of think you know they have been able to make they have been make, able to make do with that midfield so far. The Joe Linton injury, I think, it, you know, I guess changes things a little bit. But at the same time, is 
it worth selling someone like Trippier or selling someone like Almiron to just to be able to get in someone in the midfield who especially it'll probably be like a 20 million pound sign yeah who won't necessarily improve things there who's you know main role will be just to fill in for Six that months. that loss of jo Joel Linton um I'm not so sure I feel like the real kind of major surgery has to be done in the summer and yeah are you going to neglect your 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 entire right side um just to try and fill a temporary hole in the midfield I'm not so sure but let us know what you guys think in the comments below can you see any of these moves happening do you think Newcastle are due for a fire sale in the final week of the January Everyone window must go. it seems very strange doesn't it with you know someone like Dan Ashworth there like that Newcastle would be I don't know, it, 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 almost in a position where they might have to make a panic buy um, in January. We haven't really seen that from Newcastle um, under their current ownership. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But Dukes, let's get on to the, um, the foot Premier tech. League action over the weekend. Because we had two of the big title rivals, mm. um, you know, playing this weekend. Obviously, only, what, four games mm -hmm. happened over the course of the weekend. Obviously, we've got um, the game tonight too. Um, and let's start at Bournemouth, Liverpool winning 4-0 in the end, Dukes. I mean, Jurgen Klopp was not a fan of their first half performance, but they, really, anyone was. Yeah, but they really turned it on in the second half, didn't they? Um, yeah, like, what, what, what did you make of this game? What do, you, what do you think it says about Liverpool's title credentials? They're, of course, still top of the league. Yeah, absolutely. They're five points clear. I mean, City do have a game in hand, um, which shouldn't be forgotten. But at the moment, it just feels like... Liverpool, while they might not be able to put a 90-minute performance this week on week, like they are just finding ways yeah. to win week on week. And, you know, their form so far this season, just that one defeat, is pretty remarkable, to be honest. And I don't think they've been anywhere near their best. And this was supposed to be a sort of transitional year. I think when people saw that they didn't get Caicedo, that they didn't get Lavio, that they had to make do with Wataro Endo, that this was, this is not going to be their year. But actually, the closer and closer you get to it, and you look at the way they're handling the absence of Salah, the absence of Sabosai, the absence of Trent, probably their three, or at least three of their better players this season, sure. uh, I think is really, really impressive. The first half, as you say, pretty miserable. It was really bad weather uh, at the Vitality Stadium, and it was seriously windy. I think that might have had an effect on the quality of football played by both sides. Uh, but this was really controlled from Liverpool. I mean, Bournemouth only got one shot on target. Their best chance fell really late on to David Brooks when he was through one-on-one -on -one with Alisson. He sort of tries to chip him and it goes wide. But it was really nice to see Diogo Jota. You know, two excellent finishes. But, I mean, the first one is absolutely beautiful at the near post. Mm. And then the second one, he sort of skies it or sort of shanks it and then reconnects with the second I one. Think, I think he meant that. Do you think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cheese Cheek himself up. <laughs> Um, and then Darwin as well. I mean, he's now got 10 goals, 10 assists in all competitions yeah, so far. Both really season. well taken goals. Those. Really nice. I mean, I, I think last year he was on 15 goals and four assists. So he looks on track to, well, he's obviously improved his assist tally already. Um, but yeah, absolutely excellent. I mean, this was just the second time since August that he's overperformed his XG in a game. Um, but yeah, I mean, 0 0.9 expected goals per 90. He is exceptional at making opportunities for himself. And his tenacity and energy and relentless nature of uh, the sort of press that he brings as well it's just going to carry on getting him opportunities and I think yeah. he will just score a lot of goals for Liverpool he might not ever be a 25 goal per season plus striker but I think he could comfortably get to close to 20 every year yeah I think so too I think so too. I mean look at the way that that Liverpool front line used to be when you had Salah and Mane both both scoring around 20 goals a season I don't see why with another year of that forward line being together, why Nunez can't yeah can't hit those kind of yeah. heights? Um, like obviously a very different kind of player to Mane, but plays in similar positions to him, plays through the centre as well. Like yeah, I, I can I can see that happening. Um, and like you say, dudes, like a lot of those assists were for Salah as well. So when Salah comes back into the side, we might see Nunez, um, you know, maybe become slight less of a goal threat and, and, and kind of act in service mm. of Salah again. Um, but certainly great to see um, you know, Jota in particular. I mean, Jota's record this season is just outrageous it's, it's given, really the, given the kind of limited minutes he's actually had um, and probably should have got a penalty as well. Yeah. Um, not really sure why that wasn't. could have also been sent off. Yeah. That was a pretty yeah. nasty challenge. I think it was an accident, but it was still pretty nasty. Still, it doesn't really matter about intent, does it? If it's, yeah, if, if it's, it's deemed to be dangerous. But um, but yeah, so it could have been even more for Liverpool. Absolutely electric second half performance. Let's talk about Arsenal then, um, who on Saturday, of course, played Crystal Palace, beat them 5-0 
at the Emirates. Um, you know, they were coming off four games without a win, weren't they? Um, they really needed that three points. Um, and it was a pretty complete performance, I think, from, from the Gunners. Really dangerous from set pieces, of course, through Gabriel um, with the first and second goals. Um, bit harsh, I think, not to have given <laughs> him that second one with the own goal from Henderson. Uh, I guess it technically wasn't on target. It looked, <laughs> looked pretty on target to me. It was so close, um, so close to the goal uh, when he got his head on it. Um, and then two goals in, in added time from Martelli. Obviously, a great, great goal from uh, Trossard as well. That was a really nice finish. Um, but yeah, I mean, 3.5 XG to Palace's 0.3. Uh, most they've created a game since their own 4-0 away uh, away win at Bournemouth earlier in the campaign. Um, so yeah, it looked, looked pretty comfortable. Having said that, they were playing a Palace team who had had nowhere near as much rest as Arsenal. Arsenal hadn't played in about almost two weeks. Yeah, I think it's 12 days. Um, They've been in dupes. Yeah, been in dupes. Sipping doing, on some pina yeah, coladas. Yes, pina coladas, warm weather training. <laughs> um, whereas, yeah, Palace had yeah not had that time off. Um, and, you know, the fans are beginning to turn on Roy Hodgson yes. now, which is pretty worrying stuff. Um, 15th, they're only five points to go the relegation zone now. Luton have a game in hand on them as well. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty tough times for Crystal Palace. Their home form has been abysmal this season as well, hasn't it? You kind of thought before Christmas with that draw against City, with that narrow loss to Liverpool, that maybe there was some momentum um, starting to come back into that Palace team. Um, but yeah, 5-0 uh, away at the Emirates. Um, you know, not doing much for the confidence there and Arsenal's next game in the Premier League away at Nottingham Forest next Tuesday I mean do because like for me I don't know what your thoughts are on this I don't know whether this win it was a great win against Palace one that they needed but I still feel like City and Liverpool are a cut above in this title race I know Arsenal are not too far off them and so if they do improve consistently um, then I could see them getting back into the title race, but I just think a, you know, a slightly understrength, well, an understrength Liverpool going away to an informed Bournemouth and getting mm. that four 0 win is markedly more impressive than what Arsenal did to a, 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 a Crystal Palace, who are almost at rock bottom. I feel at the Emirates. Um, what are your thoughts? Would you? Would yeah, you I say totally agree with that about which result was more impressive, especially. I mean, Bournemouth's record prior to their game against Spurs I think they'd won sort of six and seven I think they've been absolutely remarkable whereas Palace have only won two of their last 13 I think only Burnley have taken fewer points in mm -hmm. that time they're in the relegation zone so people might be like well, you know why are Palace fans complaining you're 15th in the table but you know they're pretty tight to Luton and Luton have a game in hand in 18th so you know Palace on current form are heading for relegation if it continues at this rate so they have every right to complain and I think there's been a sort of slight lack of foresight on their front uh their side about what their their issues are i mean someone uh there's a crystal palace fan who i've just started following on tiktok i'm sorry i can't credit you but he made an excellent video about palace's right back situation over the last few years mm. and he said they bought nathaniel klein in about or they had him coming through the academy in about 2008 2007 8 they then replaced him with joel ward when klein left Joel Ward then got replaced by Aaron Wan-Bissaka. When Wan-Bissaka was sold, he was replaced by Joel Ward. And then they brought back Nathaniel Klein to replace Joel yeah. Ward. And it's like, they've only had three right-backs in for, for pretty much the majority of the 21st century. That which is, is bizarre. Which is pretty mental. Um, but I thought that was a very good way of summing up just like Palace's slight lack of inventiveness at times. But anyway, in terms of the title race, I agree with you. I think this scoreline slightly flattered Arsenal, to be honest. I mean, it was two goals mm. after the 94th minute in this, two set-piece goals as well, but they are seriously effective at set-pieces. I think it's nine goals directly from corners this season, Brilliant. 12 from set-pieces in general. That's excellent, particularly when your forward line hasn't clicked in the same way it did last year. But for Martinelli come up, to come off the bench and double his season tally, that was really impressive. I thought both of his finishes were excellent. But as you say, just a really, really flat Crystal Palace lacking any sort of energy and sort of ambition on the ball so yeah it was very one-sided I feel like Arsenal need to make a big statement in one of their bigger games against City and Liverpool Liverpool I mean Liverpool's coming up in two weeks time absolutely because they've got they've got Nottingham Forest then they've got Liverpool at home in the Emirates you win there and I think the sort of energy and the mood and everyone's thoughts around Arsenal slightly change but 
you know, it really has to be a win there, I think. Um, and then I'd start to believe a little bit more. But that's what's what, what went down in the Premier League. But we've got to touch before the end of the show on the Bundesliga in the Cubs because this yes. felt like an absolutely massive weekend in the title race. Huge weekend. Huge, huge weekend. I mean, first of all, Leverkusen. Um, what a comeback. Coming back uh, to win away at Leipzig on Saturday. Uh, coming back from behind twice. Um, I mean, what a game this was. I mean, Leipzig were clearly the better team in the first half. Javi Simmons, I think, with one of my favourite goals of the season. I mean, just lovely. he's just a magical player, isn't he, Javi Simmons? I can't wait to see him at, like, a Barcelona or a Real Madrid or someone Arsenal in the last future. Week. I mean, yeah, I mean, Arsenal would be Very lucky. pretty outrageous. I mean, I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, he, he's, he's certainly worthy of, of that level. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where he goes next. But, but anyway, I mean, yeah, Went in one nil up at half time. Nathan Teller then replied at the start of the second half. Um, Leipzig then caught them on the counter attack. Lois Appenda um, yes, with a great finish um, to make it two one. And then Jonathan Tarr headed in from a corner after that. Pierre Hincapier then finishing off the comeback in stoppage time. Alex Grimaldo with another two assists to his name. Casual. There's a great. It was actually a great ball across the box to Nathan Teller, although Nathan Teller probably should have been picked up. Um, and then a great cross in for Hincapié. Um, Alex Grimaldo, I think Europe-wide, surely signing of the season on Gotta a free. On a free. I mean, can't be top. Fifteen goal involvements in eighteen games. A couple of great frees actually. Marcus Taram on a free is. Pretty, Marcus Taram's brilliant. great as well. But in terms Grimaldo. of like someone who, yeah, someone who who has been able to. You know, kind of, you know, help make up the, you know, the the deficit that you they lost with, you know, Diaby in terms mm. of like goal involvements. Someone who, yeah, it was is able to provide an even bigger threat goal wise and, and assist wise uh, from the opposite flank to Jeremy Frimpong. I think also just the fact that he's a bit of a maverick, the fact yeah. that he can score a screamer, the fact that he's so good from set pieces, um, I think is just, yeah, I, I, I don't think like, uh, Leverkusen are in the position they are right now without Grimaldo. I might um, actually tweet this because I'm interested to hear people's opinion. I don't know whether a club has, I'd be interested to hear people's thoughts, ever had a more successful summer window or any window than Leverkusen. You look at mm. Xhaka, Hoffman, Grimaldo, Boniface as a yeah. window. I mean, I'm sure, I can't remember, maybe there's some other deals in there as well, but given the fact they lost probably their best player of the last few years, Moussa Diaby, and replaced him with that load of quality and they've all been yep. such incredible hits. I think it says a lot about Xabi Alonso as well, but and Absolutely. their recruitment team. It's just been magnificent. Yeah, I mean, certainly very efficient in terms of those four players all having an impact. Um, Boniface, of course, as well. You know, not due back until April. Um, yeah, Leverkusen are just, they're, they're just absolute clutch at are the Are you moment. starting to believe? I'm starting to believe. Well, I mean, we'll get onto it, but I mean, Bayern Munich have... Uh, Union Berlin on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. That is their game in hand. Um, so they're seven points off. That's their game in hand. If they win, then they're four points off them. And I still think it will be very, very tight because Harry Kane, not good against Werder Bremen. We'll get onto that now. We may as well get onto that now. But um, Leroy Sane also not great against Werder Bremen. But generally speaking, they're both having like career defining seasons. Um, like, uh, that that Bayern Munich squad is still is still brilliant and is still deeper than Leverkusen's, um, and it's Bayern Munich. But if they don't get a result against Union, if they don't win, then I think Leverkusen have to be heavy favourites. Um, I mean, they've looked so good. They've only dropped points in three games, haven't they? They've still let, yet to lose this season. They're on for a record-breaking points tally, aren't they? Um, and I guess you can look at say like. Arsenal last season who were also on for I think 98 99 mm. points around this time of the season and then had their drop off it is possible it is possible with a with a with a squad which is only challenging for a title for the first time which is still have the Europa League as well still have the Europa League of course and also have you know are up against a side which psychologically will always have the upper hand just because of the history the recent history there in Bayern Munich um what is it are they on for a it's 12th. 12th yeah. this season. 12, um, just a casual 12. Just a casual 12 in a row for Bayern Munich. But let's get on to Bayern Munich because, I mean, Dukes, I mean, they absolutely crumbled against Werder Bremen. I mean, they, they created more chances, but a lot of those came late in the game when they were already 1-0 down. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, what? Yeah, what do you make of this Bayern team and, and this performance? Well, a little weekend? bit troubling as well. I mean, there was a goal correctly ruled out for a foul. Yeah. Um, but but he had so much. He had acres of space. Justin uh, Jinman, uh, Jinman, I think is how you pronounce yeah. it. Um, but VAR ruled it out because Musiala was fouled in the build-up. But he was running through with sort of 60 meters of space yeah. and, and Delict was trying to chase him down. But that is just feels like I've seen that Barn try and, well, they didn't actually concede a goal in that uh, in this occasion, but I've seen them sort of almost concede so many goals like that over the last few years. And then the actual goal, Alfonso Davis has just got to do a bit better. He's got to be a bit stronger there. Um, and Michel Weiser, who used to play for Bayern Munich, so the curse of the former player, absolutely roofs it into the uh, into the top of the net. Um, Bayern, of course, created more XG as you'd expect, um, but their best chance fell to Dio Tupamakano, who was like in a striking position at that particular moment. Yeah. Um, but they just didn't click as we've expected them to over the last uh, sort of months or so. And, and given the fact that the previous Friday against Hoffenheim, they played so well and it was so dominant and so easy. And it felt like, you know, with Bar Leverkusen having some absences for the AFCON, uh, with some injuries picking up as well for them as well, it felt like, OK, yeah, we've seen what's happened in the first half, but this is going to be a different story. So this, mm. you know, Leipzig are a really horrible opponent to play. Yeah. Uh, always carry a threat, even when they don't dominate the ball, that you just can't switch off for a second because that counter press is just absolutely lethal and they will just go straight through you. Um, but yeah, to get through that game with the injuries they've got, with the sort of sort of feeling at the end of that game as well, it, uh, there is an element of, you know, Arsenal around this time last year, there was a lot of dramatic late winners, there yeah. was a lot of sort of energy expanded and I just wondered whether that slightly sort of came back to bite them towards the end of the campaign like you don't want to be having to push this late in every game yeah and that's what two in a row for Leverkusen with late winners so I'd like to see a bit more control early but I think they can mix it up really effectively um yeah Archie Rinter who's an excellent pitch side reporter for ESPN he was asking Jonathan Tarr after the game like what's Leverkusen's style if you had to say it was a music uh, like a, a genre of music is yeah. it all jazz and Tar went no 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 it's not jazz sometimes it's a bit rock and roll and then some really hardcore rap anyway <laughs> he was basically like implying that they don't have one set of style yeah. that they yeah. don't need to dominate the ball they often you know sometimes when they have the ball I think they almost look at their weakest it's when they spring on those counter attacks mm. I think they're so effective so I would love to see it happen because of my reputation as a curse I don't want to say it will happen but I would yeah. absolutely love to see it happen. I think most people around Europe would as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. Bayer Leverkusen. Bring it on. Jazz. I mean, I think they do need to go back because I think it has been a bit rock and roll, a little bit hardcore rap in the last couple of weeks. Um, you bring know, back the kind jazz. Of dramatic. I think bring back the jazz, like a little bit more controlled, mm. nice improvisations. Um, yeah, like, you know, tricking the opposition into thinking that uh, you know, you're not in control, and in fact, you are absolutely yeah. in control. But Palacios going off injured, that's a big one. Yeah. Jonathan Tarr's suspended for the next game, that's yeah. a big one as well. Although Piero Hincape as well, uh, who I recommended for Liverpool and Sunday Vibes, although they don't need him, they've got Joe Gomez. <laughs> um, but he had an excellent game, obviously um, scoring the winner as well, but a real crunching tackle. I think it was on Benjamin Sesco in the first mm. half as well. Yeah. Really, really nice. Uh, yeah, Palacios, big, big miss though. Yeah, back mid February, I believe. So that's that's the thing if they can if they can keep winning games with without you know their, their number one striker up front as well it's you know yeah they're, they're yeah squad wise they're they're in a tough position but i still say they're, they're underdogs get, yeah. but i'm enjoying it yeah let's see what happens on wednesday between Bayern and union Huge. let's finish off quickly i guess with i alluded to it earlier actually probably don't need to speak about it too much but ivan tony coming back um for brentford after dudes. a week of flirting he wasn't too tired yeah, wasn't yeah, wasn't he's flirting tired. with big clubs all week. <laughs> uh, but I don't understand why Brentford fans aren't more frustrated, to be honest. But to be fair, he they need him. He backed it up. He, yeah. yeah, he backed it up massively uh, with that goal. Slightly controversial. He moved it twice yes. and moved the foam around yeah, the ball as well. Yeah. I've never seen anyone do that. Uh, and then he said in his post-match interview, "You're allowed to move the ball half a yard either side." I've never heard of that. Well, I mean. If you're if you're not allowed, then VAR just didn't pick it up. To yeah, be fair. I mean he, he's worth and, a shot. And and, and, I, and I think yeah, I mean to be fair, I haven't like maybe we should have researched whether that's actually a rule, but it it would make sense because 
where a foul happens on the pitch, it doesn't happen on one spot, does mm. it? It kind of happens in a it kind of happens in a, thought, in, a, in a two three yard area. Yeah, but I thought when the referee they definitely used to as long as you're not moving they it d- further forwards. They used to forwards. spray around and yeah. then drop the ball in there yeah. and then go out and spray the line. So yeah. by my logic, I'm like yeah. you can't take it outside the originally sprayed circle mm. line. Yeah, I don't know. I don't um, know. What they, I guess I don't think. They I think if you're that. moving it, uh, it, surely if you're moving it further the forward or further back, it would be a bit more of an issue. But side to side, feels well, like, I yeah. think side to side was quite a big one on this occasion. Oh, it definitely was a big one on this occasion. I mean, the it wall was, is not genius. set up correctly no. either because there is. It's, also, what's Callum Hudson Odoi doing? Just, uh, yeah. just standing there. Like, I, I, what, what, there like, why is he? Well. Why is he being put in that position? Yeah, it um, wasn't clever from Nottingham Forest, but Brentford, as you say, they really needed this as well. They'd lost five in a row. Uh, and it felt like such a, a huge moment for Ivan Tony. Uh, obviously, I think he's he's such a casual, relaxed player. He didn't almost seem that bothered that he'd, you know, not been able to play for eight months. Uh, or he didn't feel like there was a lot of guilt on his shoulders. No. Judging by his interviews, he no. doesn't seem to, A, be very contrite about his gambling problems uh, or, you know, the influence that could have on young kids, etc. And obviously there's a lot of sympathy that, you know, should go to any footballer with a gambling addiction yeah. when they are playing in a game that you are so surrounded by betting. Well, yeah, um, I mean, that's that was one thing we noted. It was like, you know, there was there was a big light, light show for Tony's return. While that light show is happening, you've got Betway being, you know, th- what, what not. And I mean, we're not, you know, we're we're not innocent at this. We've done, you know, yeah, sponsored yeah, content guys, before guys, with, with 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 betting companies before. But it is, but it is like it, it is that it is a weird jarring thing where it's like you have footballers who you know probably correctly are you know face big bans for for gambling offences um but the problems that lead to that um or the or the pressures that lead to that are not being addressed yep. uh, within the game i know that there is going to be a ban on front of shirt sponsors for betting companies what is it from the 25 26 season okay. if i'm not uh, I might be wrong on that but it's it's either two se- from two seasons time or three seasons time uh but that won't cover Sleeves. I, I, I don't think that covers you know betting uh you know sponsorship around the stadium, it's advertising like around the stadium. The way, so it's it? not yeah, it's it's probably not doing enough. Um, but but uh, aside from that, yeah, big win for Brentford. Yeah, like, you were there. You know, uh, yeah, I was there. Yeah, like I was saying earlier. Neil uh, Mopay's winner. Neil Mopay's winner was just absolutely brilliant. Um, also shout out Chris Wood, great header. Yeah, I think Chris Wood could actually end up with twelve plus Premier League goals this season. It's like is, a Glenn Murray 2018. It is. I was, I, I was literally thinking that <laughs> on the day. I was like, is this Glenn Murray all over Are you going to do a late year? Oh, he's, 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 he's a Kiwi. <laughs> <laughs> he's a Kiwi, mate. He's a Kiwi. Um, Can you imagine a late uh, minute transfer to the England squad? Yeah. Uh, so, yes, yeah, shout out Chris Wood. And also, I was impressed by Oral, Oral Mangala from a Nottingham Forest perspective. I think he's a really a really good midfielder and, and should be playing, I think, at a, at Although a better club. I think club. he gave away the file that... Um, that Tony's Tony scored from, from the free yeah, kick. Although, yeah, you know, people yeah, less so, out. less so. I think more, more on the ball, more on the ball. He's not the the most amazing defensive midfielder from a defensive standpoint, I don't think. But on the ball, he is, he's really good to watch. Nice, it? yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Callum Mustardoy's ball in for um, beautiful the header was really, yeah. really nice, really low, but also just perfectly placed. Loved yeah. it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, to be fair, yeah, Wood didn't need to do all that too much. He just needs to get a little little flick on there. Uh, but that's all we have time for on Monday Vibes for today. Uh, let us know your thoughts on the Premier League title race, on the relegation battle as well. We did touch upon it briefly there too. And the Bundesliga title race. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that was basically everything we covered. Oh yeah, Newcastle transfer business. Do you think there are going to be any big moves? between now and the end of the season uh, and the end of the transfer window sorry Uh, because yeah I'm I'm losing faith a little bit (laughs) Um, but uh, yeah hope you're all doing well have a good week and we will catch you on Sunday vibes vibes. Um, oh yeah also go and check out our interview with Omari Hutchinson and Leif Davis at Ipswich we set them a challenge um, to name the best Wonder Kids XI in the championship Uh, that came out on Sunday so uh, Saturday sorry so go and uh, give that some love but uh, yeah thanks for watching guys And we'll see you next time.